Hey, Love Rights, this is Tom Nando, and welcome tonight. We have Michael King from the band Microcycle. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for joining hey, Tom. us. Hey, Tom. How's uh, it going? I'm very well, thank you. So tonight, we're going to be playing in the background three of um, Mike's new songs that he sent to us. So the first um, track that we have is Beyond the Realm of Sanity. Then it will be Cliché. And then Freak Bay. Freakbay.com. So you want to just um, let everyone know a little bit about yourself. Oh, uh, I, uh, I'm not a career musician. I have a regular job, just like most people do. And I record music as a hobby on the side. Uh, a lot of people seem to like the music I'm recording. So that's pretty cool. So can you tell us a bit about the new writing process? Obviously, for Beyond the Realm of Sanity. How did that go? Okay, Beyond the Realm of Sanity, um, I brought a couple of riffs into uh, live rehearsals. Um, I have a lead guitar player named Richard Hanaski. Oh, cool. And Richard... Sorry. Richard um, took what I had and helped me arrange it, and then he added a couple of things to it. Yeah. And I took it from the rehearsal to the studio and I laid down the whole rhythm track at the studio. And then we just built the song from there. Richard actually recorded all his guitar parts at his own house and then brought a thumb drive to the uh, crash lab where I record. And yeah. we plugged, I don't, I'm not real technical with this stuff, but they were able to plug the thumb drive into Pete's computer and just dump the tracks right onto the song. And mm -hmm. um, the end result is what you hear. Um, Michael Sudbrink, we call him Surly. He's the singer on that song. And he took my words and just started singing. And what you hear is what he sang. It's yeah. Pretty cool. You so know? are the vocals for the three tracks all yours? No. Um, Surly sings on, on Beyond the Realm of Sanity. Um, yeah. Tommy Hanley is a co-writer of the lyrics on Freakbag.com. He yeah. sang that one, and I sing on Cliché. Which is amazing. I must admit, it's very cool. Yeah. So what's the story behind the band name? How, how did that all come about, Myco Psycho? Yeah, it was just me driving in my work truck, you know, like wordsmithing. And I don't know, I just, it, it just came out. And I was like, that's what I'm going to call my band. And that's what I did. You know, there's, there's no great story behind it or anything like that. I was just playing around with words in my truck. Wow. And it just sort of stuck. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, and, you know good, it's yeah. funny because uh, I, got, I got a lot of friends that are musicians. One of them is my friend Phil Richards. He records at Pete's studio also. Um, he coached me through the vocals on, um, on, on Cliché. And I'm in his phone as Maiko. <laughs> he says, I know a million Michaels, but I only know one Maiko. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, That's fun. cool. Yeah. So obviously, uh, lockdown, you've been quite active. Um, so are you planning on actually releasing a full album for next year? I don't know, because, you know, these things take money, which, you know, I, I don't have extra money to do that. So I, I don't know. I, I'd like to get a CD Baby uh, release out, but I, I don't know if I can. You know, I, I'm, I'm waiting to see, you know, a um, few things might happen, you know, um, to do that. You know, also, there's always some record label interest, uh, yeah. believe it or not. Um, I know people have been musicians their whole lives and don't get offers. And I've had a few so far. Uh, none what I would call something that I would actually sign on to. Yeah. You know, nothing's that good yet. So we'll, we'll wait and see. Cool. Um, so you can tell me what um, the story behind Cliché is. Yeah. Cliché. Cliché started out as a song... Uh, again, I had the music. I go into the studio with the raw clay, and we build the song from, from the raw clay. But the idea behind it is pretty interesting. I was going to take a bunch of different cliches and fashion them into the lyrics for the song. Um, only the idea didn't work. 
I, I you know, like I, I'm pretty good with words and everything, and it yeah. just it just wasn't working. So I had the lyrics that that ended up being the lyrics for Cliche since 1982, I think I wrote them, and they've wow. just been kicking around. You know, like maybe maybe eight years ago, I I got when I got my first iPhone. I typed them into the phone so I wouldn't lose them and wouldn't go senile and, and lose them. Yeah. And uh, I'm driving in my truck with the track playing on my truck stereo. And I just started singing those words along to the track and it just seemed to really fit and work really well. Um, I couldn't change the name of the song without, without trashing it and moving it to another uh, yeah, another song in Pro Tools because you can't change the name once you start the file. So no. we just kept the name as cliche, and you know, I threw "Lord Have Mercy" in there, which is kind of a cliche, you know, just to have a cliche, you know. Yeah, as you can hear now, it's playing. I love it. It's very motorheadish, isn't it? It's all Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people are telling me a lot of my friends I sent it out to. People are telling me it sounds Aussie-ish. Uh, yeah. Somebody told me I sound like Tom Araya from Slayer. I don't know, mm. you know. Um, you know, all compliments, which I'm happy about. That is really cool feedback as well, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I got a really good feedback on that song from a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. So what inspired you to be a musician? Where did it all start for you? Dude, you know, I'm going to say that it started around 1968 when I was five years old. Um, my, my mother's, my mother's the eldest of her siblings and my parents were very young when I was a little kid. So we would, me and my brother would spend every weekend at my grandmother's house. And my uncle John is only 17 years older than me or, or no, he's 14 years older than me. And in 1968, he had, he had a stereo in his room and he had Beatles cassettes. And I was listening to uh, the song Day Tripper really stood out for me. And wow. I, in 1968, at five years old, I would air guitar to that song. You know, <laughs> I don't think air guitar was a thing. I don't know. But no, I would no, air, no. the riff in that song was just, just strikes a chord with me. I love it. You know, and then, you know, fast forward another eight years. I'm 13 years old. I'm getting into music. Kiss was probably the first, you know, band I got into. Uh, and, you know, at 13 years old, you, you go to – my first concert was Kiss. And you go to a Kiss show with the lights and the explosions and the makeup and the costumes. And I, I literally, when they first came out, I had tears in, in my eyes. I couldn't believe I was there witnessing this. You know? Wow. And, and that really did it for me. Uh, Blue Oyster Cult was another band I saw early on. Um, and Blue Oyster Cult got me into Rush because Rush opened up for them in 1977. And, dude, I went to a Blue Oyster Cult concert to see Blue Oyster Cult and left the Rush fan. Wow. They were amazing. That's fantastic, yeah. Alex Lyson is one of my, my biggest influences, you know, uh, for my rhythm work. So the influences in the 60s when you were growing up, that must have been quite different progressing into the 70s as well. Well, I was a little kid in the 60s, you know. I was I was born in 63, so you know, I wasn't I wasn't 13 until 1976 and that's when I really got into the music. Before that, it was always just whatever was on the radio in the car when we were going somewhere. Cool. So what what was the best bit of advice growing up about becoming a musician? What, you know, what did you yeah. find that uh, you know, I, I, I had an unusual path because I, uh, my cousin Danny, he's like a brother to me. We're, right. we're, a, we're a year apart in age. And when he turned 18, he joined a band up here in New York that was from New Orleans. And then he moved to New Orleans. Okay. He came back to New York with a different band in 1985. Um a band called Lily and Axe. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, I go to the, I go to their first show in Queens, New York. You know, I meet everybody backstage, 
And then I'm standing next to the sound guy and the light guy. And the, the light guy, his name was Mr. Free. And Mr. Free is telling me, oh, God, you got to see these guys. It's the greatest band. You, you know, you're going to be so surprised. And I was kind of weirded out, you know, like, wow, this guy's really into this band, you know. By the fourth song in the set, I, I weaseled my way up to the front of the stage with my jaw on the, on the floor because, first of all, my cousin is an animal behind the drums. Even if, even at 55 or 56 years old, he's still a monster and well-respected in the New Orleans area as a drummer, okay? Steve Blaze was the, is their guitar player. He still has Lillian Axe, Steve Blaze. And it was the second coming of Randy Rhodes for me. The guy could oh. play anything. He, he, he's one of those guys that could play anything he hears instantly and transpose it right to the guitar. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what style, jazz, classical, anything. He's just that talented. And Johnny Vines, who I mentioned in the song Cliché, in the, in the voiceover part, uh, the best unknown front man you've ever seen, I've ever seen. The guy ruled the stage. He knew how to make the girls love him, you know, by his movements on stage. And then there was a guy named Mike Max, who was the bass yeah. player, just a total monster with his big bushy blonde hair. He was crazy. You know, he would smash the bass on his head while he was playing. He was just a complete nut. Okay, so these four guys come out on stage and they just ruled the stage. I couldn't believe what I saw. So I hung out with them the whole time they were here. And like three days after meeting them and hanging with them, we find out that their guitar technician is, is leaving uh, when they get back to New Orleans. So everybody seemed to like me and they offered me the gig. So I moved to New Orleans, became the guitar tech for the top band on the circuit and made a ton of friends. But I also got to see the shitty side of the music business. You know, a lot of stuff happens. And that's why I knew not to try and do it full time. You know, but I've always been a fringe guy. I've always been around bands. I've always you know, hung out with musicians. Um, never thought any of my music was any good until I started recording it. People started telling me, hey, that's really good. It is really good. You should really Thank start having you. You know, a lot of confidence in yourself. You've obviously got a big fan base as well on, on your actual Microsoft page. I see the interaction on there. A lot of people love it. Yeah. Especially Satan Slave. Satan Slave was amazing as well, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. can, can you sort of tell me a little bit about that track as well? Because, as you know, that is my favourite track right. that you've written. Satan Slave, I wrote the music for that when I was somewhere between 16 and 18 years old. Um well, what happened is, is I don't play cover tunes. I, I never really got into guitar to play cover songs. But everybody I knew as a teenager, that's all they did is they played cover music. So yeah. I made friends with this guy, Rick, who was a drummer. His father and mother were divorced, and he lived with his father. And they didn't have any living room furniture at their house because Rick had a Ludwig Octoplus drum set in the living room. And then everybody would go there to Rick's house, you know, uh, after school at night to jam. His father ran his law office out of the house, so you had to be quiet until five o'clock. Um, and then after five o'clock, it was no holds bar. He, he would, yeah. he would, you know, his father would leave and go out and we would just all jam. But I didn't do the cover music. So when nobody else was around and it was just me and Rick, I'd plug in a guitar to the best amp that was there that other people left. And I would make stuff up. And Rick was just this really good drummer. Um, it didn't matter what I made up. He could come up with a drum beat for it. Now, I don't know jack about time signatures, 4-4 four, four versus 7-4 or whatever it is. But apparently, I, make, I routinely write stuff that's not in 4-4. Four, four. Okay? Yeah. And I don't know this until we go to lay it down. And it's not working for some reason. And then we count it out. Oh, that's what I did. It's in 6-8, you know. <laughs> so Rick just, I assumed that every drummer could do what Rick does because I, I happened to find a good one right at the beginning. One of the things I made up with Rick was Satan Slate, okay? Um, and we used to play it all the time. It was like our best song that we had at the time. Um, it didn't have words. It always had the title Satan Slave, but it never had words until I met Howard Powell who's the singer on Satan's Slave. Uh, 
And he came in. I gave him the track. I said, I need a melody. I chased after him for three or four months to get him to finally give me something. And he didn't like the song, so he just had to ask something together real quick before he showed up at Pete's house. Um, and he just sang enough over the, the, the parts of the song I needed words on to let me compose the words. So it's funny. You should friend request Howard. His name is Howard Powell. Okay? Yeah, cool. He's a great singer, and he's a good guy. I love him. But he hates, yeah. the, he hates the song Satan said. The way I got him into the studio to record the, the vocals, I told him, dude, you'll never have to play the song again. Just come in and just lay the vocal down. <laughs> yeah. So you can never go live with him then, can you? That's the problem. Well, I actually tried, and everything was going good until I, I kept saying, we got to practice Satan's Slave. He doesn't like the song, and he didn't want to do it. So so what um what kind of stuff are you listening to at the moment obviously over the years your influences have changed as you get older so what what sort of stuff are you listening to now uh you know what? i'm a creature of habit um i have like one playlist in my phone for all the music i have and i stick to the same stuff very hard to get me to listen to something new but the newer stuff I listen to, I listen to Ghost. Um, I listen to, the, there's a band called The Heavy Eyes. They're really good. Right. You should check them out. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's about it on the new stuff. I mean, uh, Pete, the guy that records me, Pete Sipper, Crash Lab Studios, he's in a band called Crash Transit. Their singer vocal coaches me when I have to lay down a vocal. Uh, great band, you know. Uh, they're not heavy metal. They're they're more of a rock band, but um, yeah. But Phil's a phenomenal songwriter and a great singer and a great front man, and he's got some really great guys around him in his band. It's a great band, you know. I can't recommend them enough. Cool man. So, can you tell me a bit about the instruments you play? Are you subject to brand loyalty, or will you just play whatever's available? Well. I have a Gibson Les Paul Custom I bought when I was 18 years old. It's a, wow. 19, it's a 1981 Custom. I bought it brand new uh, for my birthday when I turned 18. I saved up all summer for it. Um, that's my main guitar. I also have a Rickenbacker 330 Maple Glow. It's a beautiful guitar. Um, I, I use that too. But Pete has, uh, I can't even tell you how many guitars, but at, at Crash Lab Studio... There is a plethora of really fine Gibsons, Fenders uh, in that studio. And they're all tuned standard tuning A440. So that's what I record at. So it's really easy just to grab one and use it if we feel yeah. it. He's got a really nice flying V. Uh, he's got a couple of nice SGs. He's got a couple of nice Fender Strats. He's got nice Tele. Uh, He's got a uh, he's got a Setcher guitar that's really kick ass too. It's seven string. Uh, awesome. So it's whatever we feel like you know will sound good on the track, we use it. Yeah, cool. I yeah. see you, you you play the Gibson quite a lot when you do your videos. Yeah, well that's just that's my go to guitar. It sounds really good through the rig I have down yeah. in the Psycho Cave. Yeah. <laughs> so Kiss were the first band that you ever seen. Yeah. 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 Well, I did see, uh, you're going to laugh, um, uh, what were they called? The Banana Splits. <laughs> okay. Uh, in a parking lot uh, when I was like five years old. But oh, real band, the first real band I saw was Kiss. So then where does it go from sort of generation to generation? Have you got a little bit heavier or are you still the sort of the alternate glam rock sort of style? or? Um. Dude, like I, Black Sabbath is probably one of my favorite bands of all time. Judas Priest, I really love. Uh, yeah. Blue Oyster Cult, you know, and I kind of stay with those bands. Uh, Rush, Rush is in metal, but Rush just, you know, really slays it for me. It's such a great band. Uh, so we even have my, the, even my the, son loves Rush, which I'm proud of. Yeah, yeah, we have the new wave of British heavy metal over here in the eighties. Right, that was really. Yeah. Um, oh, Iron Maiden's another one that I love. Yeah, yeah Judas is part of that as well. 
right. Um, plus, you know, like I, I like I like Metallica a lot, but there's no band that I love every song that they do. So, like for for me, like I can name five Metallica songs that I really dig above all others. You know, Enter yeah. Sandman, Am I Evil, which they didn't write, but they still do a kick-ass version of. Seek and Destroy, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and King Nothing is another great Metallica song that I love. Mm. You know, um, same with Judas Priest. It's not I don't love every song by Judas Priest, but there's a bunch of them that I really dig. ACDC I love. Um, like I said, Rush. Yeah. Uh, those are my bands. That's what I listen to. You know. Have you I, I, live gigs at all? Have you done I, any like it? No, you know, in fact, um, none of these Myco Psycho songs have ever been played live anywhere. Uh, oh. A few of them have been rehearsed in the rehearsal studio, but we never made it out to a gig yet. And, and I can't, I can't settle on a, um, on a live band. Long Island is a tough place to live, and everybody's got to work their ass off to maintain a roof over their head. And eat. Yeah, so it's hard to get five guys in their fifties. To go to commit to once or twice a month to get into the studio to rehearse. It's impossible. You know, this week I can't make it. Next week the guitar player, you know, the other guitar player can't make it. The week after that, well, the drummer can't make it. And, and it's, it's, it's very frustrating, yeah. but there's nothing yeah. you can do about it. No, no, exactly. So, what was the album that changed the way that you listened to music? What was the album you picked up and thought, you know what? Wow. This is it. Ah, I never really thought about that. Uh, I don't know if there is an album like that for me. Yeah. You know, like there's just, for me, it's more about different songs. You know, I, I before you could buy one song, you know, like you could buy a song for a buck 25 or 99 cents these days. Yeah. You know, I would buy a whole album just to get one song, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. So what, fact, was, what was the song then? What was the song that, that changed it for you? Okay, uh, I'm going to go with either Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult. Wow. Okay, or or Xanadu by Rush. Okay. Xanadu is an 11 minutes plus opus that is just, like to me, yeah. it's the perfect song. You know, every song should be written like that to me, you know. That's cool. <laughs> That's amazing, yeah. But both different sort of sounding as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right, yeah. but they have something in common. They, uh, they, they don't just play, you know, like trudging bar chords and chug on anything. It's more about it's uh, picking out notes in the chords, and uh, uh, you know, like the riff and blue. It don't fear the reaper, okay? Yeah. Uh, they, with that one ringing note that that's always the same throughout, no matter what they're playing, there's always that one, you know, and, and don't fear the reaper. It's an open G string. Yeah. Know? And for some reason that intrigues me. And I write a lot of riffs in that format, you know, because I like that sound. You know, it's open and spacey and it, you're not just, you know, to me, anybody can just chug away on on an E and A string, rum, 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 you know. Anybody, can yeah. And, and there were some great songs that do do that, but that's not how I, I I think, you know. I really think you should get an album done, man. I think you've got lots of content to make a really good album. I have I have like fourteen more songs in Pete's computer in various stages of uh, wow. uh, of being finished. You know, I have this one called Automatic. As soon as I find the melody, it's going to be done. It's something that you're going to really like. I would love it, yeah. It's, we'll, it's, we'll it, it. You know that. No, yeah, but it's just, it. it's just, it's a heavy metal song that I know you'll like. You know? Something different. Yeah. Wicked. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and like I said, it's got, it's got some chugging in it. It's got some picked out notes in it. And it, it, um, the the what I think is going to be the chorus is like in six eight time. It's not in four four, you know. And for some reason, I'm able to seamlessly play from four four to six eight back to four four, and you can't tell unless you count it. You know, it's a pretty cool thing. 
So for a young musician who's just starting out, what advice would you give them? Because the music scene is pretty tough, isn't it, at the moment? Right. I, for any musicians, whether they're starting out or they're established or what, be a, a writer on the songs. Be, be, the, be somebody that's on that copyright. Uh, yeah. The, the publishing is the most important thing to any musician. And don't ever sign it away for a couple of bucks. You know, you got to be the songwriter. Yeah, that'd be cool. So um, the other band members, can you give them a bit of a shout out? Who, who actually is part behind the scenes of My First iPhone? Okay, so you have, you have me, okay? You have Richard Hanaski. He's, he's, the, he's the lead guitar player, but he's the guy responsible for the bass line in Cliché, okay? Mm -hmm. So... Then you have, uh, Pete, you have Pete Sipper, who owns the studio I record at. Uh, he plays the leads on uh, on Satan Slave, and he does the one on Cliche, because I couldn't get Richard into the studio on time. Um, you have Howard Powell. He sings on Satan Slave. He also sings on uh, my non-metal song, Positive Vibes. Yeah. Um, you have... Phil Richards, he's the, the, the vocalist, songwriter for Crash Transit. Um, I bring him in, or, or I get him in the studio with me. He vocal coaches me. He produces stuff. Like, he just knows how to make changes to what I'm doing to make it better. I, I can't explain it. But yeah, he hears something, he tells Pete, and then Pete edits what I did. We don't even have to pull out a guitar or change anything. Pete knows how to edit, you know, really well. And cool. so Phil's real important. Uh, there's also uh, Mike, uh, Michael Sudbrink. We call him Surly. Okay, he comes in and, uh, you know, he's good for coming up with melodies. Um, and how I said Howard Powell, right? Yeah, you did, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then um, uh, ha Harold Skeet is a bass player that I sometimes use. He's also in Crash Transit. Uh, another bass player I use is this guy Joe Rockwell. Yeah, uh, he's the bass player on uh, he's the bass player on Satan Slave, and he's the bass player on Beyond the Realm of Sanity. Okay, um, Joe Joe to me would be my go-to guy. He's uh he's my equivalent in my head of having either like Getty Lee or John Entwistle so access to that type of bass player. Wow. Is that good? Wow. I mean, not to take away from Harold Skeet. Um, Harold is another one of those just monster bass players. Huh? And, yeah. And, and, and Harold's a really funny guy. He's, he's a good guy. To be that helps as well, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So freakbag.com. Um, how did how did that come about? What What's the sort of, you know, it's, it's to do with an advert, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like a, a, a metal slash punk advertising jingle. I describe it as a metal slash punk advertising jingle for a website of depravity. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what happened is this. I had the, all of the music already written. I, I wrote it in the 90s. I actually wrote that music on a really piece of crap nylon string acoustic guitar that I kept in the shop at, at a job I had at a hospital. Okay. Wow. I, I, they put me on a night shift and there was nothing to do. So I would sit in my shop and play that guitar. So I wrote, I wrote the riff in there in the nineties. And then, um, I met this, I met the guy that sings on it, Tom Hanley through my next door neighbor. Um, and then Tom started working for me. I had my own business and we were jamming me, Tom, Tom's brother, Pat, and somebody else, a few other guys at a rehearsal studio. And somewhere along the way, Tom's brother, Pat, saw some, some freaky looking girl. And he said, look at that freak bag over there. <laughs> so we were already jamming on the riff for freakbag.com. But uh, somebody, I think I said, we should just call the fucking song freakbag.com. Because... The, the riff sounded like you were saying, freakbag.com, you know? So so then Tommy and I, the singer, we were working together, and, and, and you know, we're traveling to, to and from work in a truck together. We start making up lyrics, you know, trying to make each other laugh, you know? Yeah. So 
So I come up with her hair is blue and pointy. I'm hoping that she'll boink me. I found a picture on freefag.com. And Tommy instantly goes, fuck you, little hooker. Think I'll kill and cook her. And we just started crying. We were laughing so hard we couldn't breathe. I think I even had a pullover. So it escalated from there. And it was just me and Tommy trying to out-sick each other with verses. And then we had way more verses than we actually put in the song. I, I have them somewhere. And, you know, one's just funnier than the next. So it ended up being a funny thing. Um, Tommy did the vocal on it. He did a really good job. It's exactly how it should be. Uh, and I couldn't ask for a better thing. And, uh, you know, and he deserves props for that. He's not even really a singer, you know, but he, he got that one out and he did it good. And I think it only took us maybe two hours to get that whole vocal down, you know, wow. which is pretty good because cliche took me 12. <laughs> wow, that's cool. Yeah, so I, so bought, I bought the URL, www.freekbag.com. I own it. <laughs> I'm not doing anything with it. I have some yeah. ideas, but, you know, again, everything takes money, and I don't have extra money to throw into a website. So if, if there, anybody wants to invest and open up a website, I own the URL. Let's let's talk, you know. <laughs> um, so when you started, obviously social media wasn't about at all. So, you know, we fast forward to today. How important do you think social media is for you as an artist? Oh, nobody would know about me if it wasn't for Facebook, you know. Nobody. You know, where, where does a guy like me send out songs, you know, or get anybody to listen to their songs without social media, you know? It's so hard. That back yeah. the Forget it, you know. <clears throat> what, what else can you do, you know? The good thing is about the Internet and everything is I've got maybe, maybe 12 different Internet radio stations that, you know, that play my music, you know? That is cool. That's really cool. I mean, yeah. I, I got, because of social media, there's a, a, an FM radio station in Australia that plays my stuff. Wow. Yeah. Is the, the rock scene in Australia is, is quite, quite popular, though. I, I, I know a lot of bands from Australia, and it's very, very prevalent at the moment. Uh, I guess. I don't know. I've never been, you know. The only place I've been to outside the United States is the Bahamas and Bermuda. <laughs> you know? It must be quite hard to crack the states, though. I mean, with your sound, there's a lot of alternative rock artists anyway. So, yeah. You know? Dude, guys like me are a dime a dozen here in, in the United States. There's, yeah. there's literally millions of guys that write and record music, you know? Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, luckily for me, I, I don't sound like any of them. You know, no, it is a very, very unique sound. All of the songs are very, thank you, and they've all got that different sort of element about them as well, which is quite cool. Right, it's not like you're gonna hear one of my songs and go, "Oh, that's Michael Psycho." I can tell, you know. No, exactly. I mean, if you listen to Freak Bag compared to Satan Slave or to Cliche, three completely different songs. That's it. You wouldn't to be able me. to tell. To me, that's important. You know, it's important, but I think of it this way. I'm not like a hardcore guy with anything. You know, I'm not hardcore about anything in my life. So there's yeah. no way possible for me to write 10 Satan Slaves to, or 12 Satan Slaves to put on an album. That's just not my my thing. I can't do it like that, you know. Um, and, and the riff's got to be interesting for me to play, but not difficult. Everything I write is easy to play. Anybody playing guitar three years can play anything I've written. Cool. So if you would like your fans to remember you about one thing, what would it be? I don't think it would have to do anything with my music, just that I'm a nice guy, you know. Like the cool guy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, like easy to get along with, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, I I don't think I don't think I have the signature riff out yet that that you know everybody should be like, oh my god, that's the great, you know. I don't have that yet. I'm trying. I disagree. I think 
you know, I think you should plug Satan Slave and Cliche a lot more. I think you would get a lot of feed, a lot of really good feedback. You need to sort of have a little bit more confidence about them tracks. Dude, I love those. Tra- you know, like right yeah. now, right now, driving in my truck to and from work or wherever I'm going, I'm listening to something Michael Psycho. And if it's cliche, I'm singing along with it in case the day comes, I have to actually sing it live. You know? So what's your ideal support? Who would you love to, like, be on the bill for? Dude, you know, you know, if, I had, if I got lucky enough to get on some kind of thing like that, it would have to be something really big. Uh, because I've already done, as a roadie, I, I did all the, the club and theater circuit, um, you know, as a roadie. And, yeah. you know, like, for me to, like, stop working at my day job and go on the road, it, it would just have to be something, you know, unbelievably big. Like, like for instance, a Metallica tour or a Kiss wow. tour. Something big like that. You know, yeah. and I'm not even claiming to be worthy of this, but that would be my dream, you know. You never know, do you? All you need to do is for them guys to hear one of your tracks. And that's how it works, isn't it? Dude, I, pushed, I pushed them out like crazy. I'm a, sa- a shameless self-promoter, you know. Why not? You know those, you know, you, you see the, the picture somebody posts on Facebook and it's this giant PA system outside and it says, yeah. what's the first song you'd play on this? I, I paste the song Satan's Slave in the comments. Satan's Slave by Michael Psycho, you know? But the odd thing is, and I even noticed it with the Metal Lab, I posted Satan's Slave on there yesterday. 19 people looked at the video. Only two hit like. You and one other guy hit like. And that, that's discouraging to me. You know, it seems like everybody wants to post their music, but nobody wants to listen to anybody else's. Yeah, yeah. That is, I think it's just the way people are feeling at the moment as well, aren't they? You know? I, I don't know what it is. You it's know, quite like, dark, isn't it? This is the thing. So maybe, you know, people can relate to it, but social media isn't always the best place to interact with the track. Right, I guess, but you know, like if you click on a YouTube video, you, you'll yeah. know in a couple of seconds if you want to continue listening or not. And it yeah, doesn't seem like people want to click on it, you know? Oh, yeah, look, mm-hmm. you know, oh, yeah, there's a, some other guy has a song. Ooh, big deal, you know? And, and I, I listen to other people's stuff like that. Like, you know, like if, if there's a page that you, if you want to get likes for your page, you post yeah. your page there, and then people will, will click, will, will go to your link and like your page and then comment that they liked it with their link to their page. And I actually, if, if when I did that, I would actually go and listen to something that somebody else that liked my page. I would go and listen for a second, see if I liked it, you know. Um, so far, I really haven't heard anything that stood out to me. But yeah. I, I, you know, I'm picky about what I listen to, and, and you know, you know, that's just me. You know? Yeah. So, so what's next for you in the next six to twelve months? What's your plans? I don't know. I don't know. I, I you know, I want to get these. I want to get people listening to these songs. Uh, yeah. I, I'd like to get my page to ten thousand likes, but I, I get four and I lose three. You know. It, it, it's really hard. If I could get to 10,000 likes, I could start talking to uh, different companies about endorsements, you know, okay. and that's something I'd like. I'd like to have an endorsement of something, you know. Um, that's even though we can help with promotion. We'd always yeah. To help. You know, um, there's a, you know, and then there's a, there's a lot of people out there that, that bullshit you and waste your time, too. Yeah. You know? yeah I, a lot I had a woman a few, uh, several months ago messaging me uh, she had a record label and she's gonna send me she's gonna give me a contract and you know i like okay here's my email address no 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 i do things by by snail mail i i hate i hate email so yeah she said she sent me a date that the contract was supposed to arrive at my house it never came and when i questioned her about it she unfriended and blocked me Oh, you know, why do you even waste my time? I don't get that, you know? Yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? It's very sad. Yeah. 
So we're going to sort of close. Um, okay. So is there any like mentions or thank yous or anything that you'd like to to give out tonight? Because obviously Dude, you've got, got a lot. Of that as well, I got a, I got a laundry list. You ready? Cool. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> you got Pete Sipper, Crash Lab Studios, Belmore, New York. Okay. If you got to record, you go to you go see Pete if you live in this area. Phil Richards, Crash Transit Band. Okay. Um, Jeffrey DeBerry from the Rock Casserole, uh, Groovy Lynn, another radio, uh, internet radio personality, uh, the Rock Dog, um, the Rock Goddess. Okay, these are all people that play Michael Psycho on their internet radio wow. show. Um, who else? How Howard Powell. Michael Sudbrink, um, Harold Ski, Joe Rockwell, uh, Karen Bella, uh, a, a, a really talented uh, female singer-songwriter here on Long Island. Great personality. Uh, she recorded some vocals on my Positive Vibe song. Um, I think that's about it. I oh, hope so I didn't leave anybody out, you know. Uh, Steve Blaze, Lillian Axe. Uh, Sledgehammer, Danny King, my cousin, you know, these are all uh, people that I uh, I cherish in my life. All right? Awesome. That's brilliant. And and I'd like to thank you tonight for joining us and obviously being part of the Metal Lab in all of your input. It's been amazing. And hopefully we can take it into 2021 and get you this, you know, this 10,000. I, I want that so bad. It's Myco Psycho Music on Facebook. Please come and like my page. It's so important. And also Myco Psycho Official on YouTube. And, and and I have to thank you, of course. Uh, none of this happens without peop good people like you. Thank you. We try our best. You know, so we're we're, we're here to try and promote the artists, the bands, everyone. So. Again, if you know anyone who's just up and coming, please direct them to us and we'll try and help them as much as we can. I will. Um, cool, man. All right, so man. Thank, thank, thank you. you tonight. So for all your news, reviews and live interviews, just rem remember to join me at the Metal Lab, the home of underground metal. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Metal Lab. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.